Oh, my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, but no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested in my life began. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he paid for me for. He canceled my debt. He called me his friend. Yes, he did. When Rejoiced as though heaven had gone. Oh, no.
Hey everybody, Pastor Ross here with Josh Grochi. Hey, every Thursday we combine our efforts. I put on Amplify, 6.30 to 8 for your 6th through 12th graders. That's a place for kids to get introduced to Jesus Christ from them to bring their friends, hang out, and enjoy their time together. And if you're an adult, we have Celebrate Recovery Perfect for you. It goes from 7 to 9 p.m. If you're suffering with any type of hurt, habit, or hang up, it's the place to be. So we want to invite you out Thursdays beginning 6.30 and for us at 7. We'll see you then. Good morning, church. Sam Kraut here. I'm the worship director at Emmanuel. Wanted to let you know we've got exciting things coming up. November 5th, we're having Sanctus Real come in to do a concert. It's going to be awesome. You can sign up at eflint.org slash concert. I want to remind you that we are continuing to take our offering for our 24 missionaries' families. It's called Christmas in October. We have two more weeks for you to give your special, above your regular offering to the missionaries for their special Christmas. So be sure and designate. Good morning, church. Pastor Matt here. Our first thing is our Kersley Outreach event. We've been invited to their harvest party. If you haven't signed up, you can do so in the back of the auditorium. If you brought candy with you today, drop it off in the lobby. There's a bin behind the Welcome Center with a little sign there that tells you where to put the candy. If you want to bring some up to the office this week, do so during office hours. That event is Thursday, so make sure you get it in by then. Uh, the next thing is Upward Basketball for K4 up through 6th grade. You can sign up now. This is the last week where you can get the early bird discount of $65. Normally it costs $80, so sign up before next Sunday, the 31st, and you get that early bird discount at eflint.org slash. Good morning, church. We are excited for what God is doing in Grand Blanc. This last week, we had a team of eight people go up and work on the building, and God is doing some cool things. We're getting that building ready. The countdown is on. We cannot wait until we get in there and we do ministry in the very beginning of January. I want to encourage you to keep praying. I want to encourage you to keep giving financially to the multi-site vision. And I want to give to you a couple dates. Here they are, November 6th and November 20th. Those two Saturdays, we're going to have work days at the building in Grand Blanc. We want to get you excited and involved. We can't wait to have you a part of the process as we get prepared for our soft launch in January. It's going to be incredible. Be thinking about it. Be praying about it. We'll see you then. Good morning, church. We have a special treat for you today. My good friend, Wally Rose, he's been a pastor for a number of years. He is going to be opening God's word for you today. It's going to be a powerful, just incredible time as he shares the word of God with you. Today, Sam and I are both at Lake Ann Camp. I'm leading the Father-Son Retreat. Sam is leading the worship. So be praying for us and make sure that you get excited to open the word of God and be challenged by my good friend Wally in just a little bit. Morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Good? Good. We're so glad you're here with us. Psalms 9-2 says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Would you guys please stand and join us in worship?
was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, Morning, church. Divorce, alcoholism, drug abuse. And these are just three things that used to define my life. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood to forgive a rotten sinner like me. Can I get an amen? amen. Man, we serve such an amazing God. An amazing God. If you're brand new, you've never been to Emmanuel before, 
you've came on the greatest Sunday ever. Why? Because it's the Sunday you're here. We want to welcome you. We want to welcome you in a special way. We want you to grab the connection card located directly in front of you. We want you to jot your name and your email address down on this. Return it to the Welcome Center. We have a special gift waiting for you. Also, you can text on your phone. There's a special place to do that. We'll make sure to put that on the screen so you have that available. Also, we want to let you know that here at Emmanuel, we have a purpose statement. It's something that we want to remind you of each and every week because of the power in it. We exist to honor God by making passionate disciples. This is why, this is exactly why Pastor John has pushed so hard for us to extend our ministry into Grand Blank. It's because our sole purpose here on earth is to make disciples. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. As we give today, we give as an act of worship. We know that all things come through uh, the power of Christ. So we want to give you a couple different options to go ahead and give at that. You can give at the, the box that's located at our Welcome Center. You can do that. Or you can give online or on our app. We'll make sure to leave you a link for that. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful. Your grace covers all, Lord, and we're just honored to be able to come here today and just raise ourselves up to you, Lord. Meet you, Lord. We're here to honor and glorify you with everything that we are today. Lord, we couldn't be saved. We would be burning one day, Lord, if it wasn't for you. So we're grateful and thankful that you're willing to forgive our sins. And Lord, as we give today, we give as an act of worship because all things do flow through you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and continue to worship with us. love endured that ancient cost. How precious is my Savior's blood. The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame. The image of love upon death's frame. If heavy my heart was worth Joy, could you see?
freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see
may be seated. If you're thankful this morning that you are a child of God, would you say amen? amen? Amen. Hey, we come to celebrate that today. If you're here this morning and you don't know if you're a child of God, please just listen to the message. Listen to the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit uh, work in your life, and maybe today you will become a child of God as well. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever chose that music, uh, Boy, it was theologically rich. I am encouraged. I'm sitting there, and when you're getting ready to speak and you're in a new place, there's, there's nerves that are going on. But, man, the, the songs were wonderful, and I'm singing praise to God, and it just kind of set everything at ease. And John said, hey, this is a great group to preach to. You just open the word, and, and they will be ready to go, and they will take it in. So uh, I'm looking forward to that in just a moment. The only thing I'm going to disagree with Josh about, he said, this is the greatest Sunday and every Sunday that we get to get up and worship God together is a great Sunday but I'm going to say this if you're a visitor you need to come back next Sunday and hear Pastor John uh, one of the things that drew my wife and I to this church and we've been attending for about six or seven months is man that guy just preaches he opens the word of God he he cuts it straight but he does it in love he's preaching um, a series right now called the elephant in the room and I'm going to tell you the elephant in the room this morning is Pastor John's not here but we're going to look into the Word of God nonetheless together. I'll give you a little bit uh, of who I am just by way of introduction to make a rapport with you. My name is Wally Rose. Um, I graduated from Genesee Christian High School, which was a competing school of the Christian school that Pastor John went to. And so we've known each other for a long time. As a matter of fact, we went to college together. I'm a little bit older than him, so I was there um, a few years before him. And so we've known each other for a long time, and our circles have, have bumped into each other once in a while as we both ministered in this area over the years. Currently, um, I'm the lead chaplain at the Lapeer County Jail and also the St. Clair County Jail with Reach the Forgotten Jail uh, Ministries. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. I just want to let you know that, man, I, I have enjoyed our time here. We've been, like I said, for six or seven months. We've been taken in with open arms. Uh, I appreciate so much the spirit in this place, and that spirit is to glorify God, to magnify Jesus, to edify or build one another up, and it's contagious, and man, do I love that. So uh, I'm just going to share something with you before we look into the word of God this morning. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 5, but I shared with you that John and I go back a long way. And, and we're friends, and I consider him a close friend. A few weeks ago, he was sharing something with me, and I don't know that I'm supposed to share it, but, but in the concern of love, I want to share it with you. Uh, he shared that his health has not been uh, what he had hoped it would be, that he's going through a few things, and he's not feeling quite up to snuff or quite um, what he wants to be feeling. And so he went into the doctor's office, and he had some tests run. Now, you and I know that when you go to the doctor's office, you usually don't get the results right then and there. And so he had to go home, and he had to wait for that phone call. Well, the doctor did call. Actually, it was, it was the secretary and called and, and talked to Pastor John and said, hey, the doctor would like you to bring Tammy in and have you guys come together and he would like to talk to you guys and just share what's going on. And so uh, they made that appointment. They came in together and they were sitting in the waiting room and the doctor came out and the doctor um, just grabbed Tammy and said, Tammy, can I speak to you? And left, left Pastor John in the waiting room there and he took Tammy into his office and he said, look, it's, it's worse than what we thought. Um, the test that we have run. And maybe, just maybe, if you do a few things for your husband, it'll help him and he can pull out of this thing. And so the doctor began to share with Tammy that if you let John sleep in every morning, don't set an alarm clock, let him sleep in every morning just until he wakes up naturally. If you will serve him breakfast in bed every morning, if you will cook his favorite dinner every night, if you will let him watch whatever he wants to watch on television Every day, if you will let him wear Michigan gear all the time, every day, if he can have pizza seven days a week, Tammy, if you will do all of these things for John, maybe, just maybe, he'll make it. This whole time, John's sitting out in the, in the waiting room. 
Tammy comes out. The doctor says goodbye to them, doesn't say a word to him. They get in the car together. They're driving home, and finally, Pastor John looks at Tammy and says, What did the doctor say? Just as calmly as can be, Tammy looked at John and said, The doctor said, You're going to (laughs) die. Now, two things. I have told that before, and a few people missed the fact that it was a joke. I I can tell that you didn't miss that, so I want you to know Pastor John is in fine health as far as I know. So please don't go to him and ask him about his health. Um, Number two, I know that doesn't always paint a flattering picture of the wife, and you know from as much as Pastor John shares about their relationship, those two are lovebirds and they're great, and so uh, I'm pretty sure she loves him, and I'll just leave it, I'll leave it at that. Hey, take your Bibles if you would this morning. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I have found in my life, over the course of time that I have had favorite books. When I was a young man in college, it seemed like Proverbs and it seemed like um, James were my favorite books. As I got a little bit older and read different portions of the Bible, I fell in love with Romans. And of course, I still love these books. I love Philippians and joy and to be reminded um, of what what joy we can have in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, And recently, I found myself in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians is a great book. Um, it's really, it's one play. It's a six-chapter letter. We call it a book. And it's, it's one play in two scenes. And here's what I mean by that. The first three chapters of the book of, of Ephesians, it's all about what God has done for humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. Hey, God sent Jesus Christ. He left heaven. He sent him to be born in that manger and to live a humble life and to die on the cross for our sins and and to, to, to rise again and to now be our high priest and our advocate and our interceder up in heaven. He's alive today, and God sent Jesus Christ to do all of that. And the word of God says, you that believe on Jesus, you are seated in the heavenlies. You are blessed in the person of Jesus Christ. God, the heavenly Father, looks upon you as his own child if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And and that's just scene one of this act or this play of the book of Ephesians. But then we get to chapters four, five, and six. And it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. It's kind of brass tacks kind of stuff. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this. Listen, because God has done this, you have a responsibility. If you name the name of Jesus Christ because God has done this in your life, these things should be evident in your life. It should cause you to live a different kind of life. Now, let me ask you this. Does that mean that that we don't have our own foibles? Does that mean that we're not going to struggle? Does that mean that that a child of God doesn't sin anymore? Any of those things? No, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean this, that our lives should be different. There should be a difference about our lives because of who God is and what the Bible says um, God is. If, if there could be a, a theme verse uh, for this book, and I remind you that, that it's one of the most positive books in all of the Bible. Now, I think the Bible is a very positive um, book, but this is literally one of Paul's most positive writings. He is, um, he is just encouraging the churches in Ephesus, and uh, he writes here, he says, praise, in chapter 1, verse 3, the theme, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So I have two goals here. At least I think these are supposed to be my two goals. Goal number one is that we glorify God. I want to take a few moments by way of introduction and share with you um, what the Holy Spirit led the Apostle Paul to write to all these believers at the churches in Ephesus. And may we be encouraged and may we walk out of here just as we sang today with this idea. God is amazing. God is great, and the fact he intercedes with us should blow our minds. The fact um, that we get to come into contact with Almighty God should just make us grateful um, beyond anything that we can compare to or even think about. And so I I want us to leave here. I hope we get in our cars and, 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 and... whether thinking, boy, that guy was funny, or he talked fast, or whatever it was, or worship was great, and I want us to think that, but man, I want us to get into our vehicles today and go, what a God. Man, is he amazing. Man, our Heavenly Father, unbelievable what he has done for us and what he is doing for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And then, man, I want to represent him well. I want to do, I want to live what the Word of God says. A child of God should live. Let me draw your attention. Um, Go to chapter 3 before we get into chapter 5. Let me just read a few verses to you. We'll begin in verse 17, about the middle portion 
of verse 17 of chapter 3. Paul writes this, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, listen to this, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. If you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ this morning, would you say amen? He says how long, how wide, how deep is the love of Jesus Christ. And I realize it's 2021, and I realize that, that, that we're pretty wise people, and we're pretty smart, and, and, and we know the answers to a lot of things. But sometimes, most of the time, it does us well to go back to the Word of God and be reminded of the love of Jesus Christ. Be reminded just how far down he reached to save me and to save you and just what, uh, what depths he went to to show that love to each and every one of us. And Paul reminds this group of that, but he goes on to say, And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And to know this love. Love, when I was a young man, here was my view of God. Here's what I thought of our Heavenly Father. I thought, man, God was waiting in heaven. He had his thumb out. And man, when I went to take that drink or when I swore or when I was doing something that maybe I shouldn't be doing, he was just waiting to put his thumb on me and he was going to get me and he was going to take care of business. And that literally, even though I grew up in a Christian home, that literally was my view of God. And Paul reminds the, the believers at Ephesus, we need to be reminded all the time of the love of God. Yes, he is holy. And as Pastor John spoke about last week, heaven is real and hell is real. And depending on your faith in Jesus Christ, it will determine uh, your eternity of where you uh, will spend it in either one of those places. But we as the children of God need to be reminded often of the love of God. Does he love you? Has he proven that love? Remember that verse we all learned in Sunday school, John 3, 16? I have the King James Version in my head, so that's what I'm going to say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you ever doubt the love of God, look at the cross. And that is the greatest display of the love of God. That's where Jesus hung for your sin and for my sin. And that is the symbol or the display of God's love. Let me just share, if I can, before we look into um, the, the points that I want, to see, want us to see this morning. Uh, look at chapter 1, verse 3, if you would. I want to go through a few verses on this first scene on the amazingness of God and what God has done for us or, or what we have in the person of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 3 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has blessed us in the spiritual realm with every blessing and it's all in the person of Jesus Christ. So having just read verse 3 of Ephesians, let me ask you this. Are we blessed? That, that was very Baptist. <laughs> are we blessed? Yes. We are blessed. We need to be reminded all the time. Paul, Paul had no, no issues with reminding people, hey, um, it's, it's good by way of reminder. I write this to you by way of reminder. I want you to know that you are blessed. But I also want you to know this uh, by way of theology, that you are blessed in the person of Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus. It is no other way. There is no other person. You are blessed in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said uh, in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Did you know today that there's a lot of questions about that? There's always been a lot of questions, but particularly today, there's a lot of questions. I minister in our local jails, and I will tell you this, that there is every thought and every belief under the sun about who Jesus is in the jails. And so I assume that that means that even in a place like this, we have a lot of ideas about who Jesus was or who Jesus is or if Jesus rose from the dead. Um, I, have a, I have a friend 
inside of one of the jails, and he happens to be a Muslim. And he practices the faith of Islam sincerely. And this fella has no problem with me talking about Jesus to him. This guy has no problem believing that Jesus is a historical figure. He has no problem saying and believing that Jesus um, is a prophet. As a matter of fact, when we pray, he, he's great with me closing or, or, or praying in Jesus' name. But what that man truly believes about Jesus is nothing of what the Bible says about Jesus. He doesn't believe that he's the son of God. He doesn't believe that he died on the cross for our sins. He doesn't believe that he's alive today and that he rose uh, from the dead. He doesn't believe any of those things. But Paul says here that every spiritual blessing we have in the heavenly places is through one purpose or one person. Can you say that name for me? It's Jesus, you guys, it's, it's Jesus. If we don't get anything today, it's through Jesus. God chose to bless the world through Jesus. And Paul is writing the book of Ephesians to, to kind of unpack this mystery. This is something that the prophets of old didn't quite understand because it hadn't been revealed to them yet. They were looking forward, but they didn't know uh, the person of Jesus. They didn't know how God was going to fulfill these things. And now Paul comes along and he says, hey, everybody, God fulfilled this in Jesus, and you are blessed in Jesus. Isn't God good? That's what Paul is saying in the next verse, verse 4, he says this, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. I was with Pastor John the other day, and I, I, for the life of me, I don't remember when it was. It might, it might have been Tuesday. And uh, he shared, hey, here at, here at Emmanuel, we don't struggle with Calvinism. We don't struggle with election. We don't struggle um, with those things. Is, is it a Bible word? Does the Bible say it? Uh, yes, but does the Bible also say that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance absolutely and he says so we just concentrate on jesus and 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 god will sort those things out man if the holy spirit's talking at your heart you just be obedient and say yes and and uh, i thought that was phenomenal but here um uh, god says as we sang about a little bit earlier we were chosen in christ before the foundation of the world what that means is god knows you you are known by god almighty you know i want to be popular growing up It didn't happen, just so you know, but I wanted to be, and uh, it it occurs to me that the person that is most important that I'm known by or that knows me is Jesus, and here Paul just says, you are known by Jesus. You have been um, uh, selected, you have been elected before the foundation of the world in him. We have that. That's the goodness um, of God, chapter 1, verse 5 says this, in love God predestined or predetermined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Now let me share with you. I got saved at the age of six. There used to be stairs here, and and I'm not quite Pastor John, but walking takes care of my nerves. I got saved at the age of six. I was on my bed. I had watched a movie at our local church. We had a movie night, and I don't remember what it was. Those of you that are my age or older, it might have been a thief in the night, but I really don't remember, and you guys remember those, those old films. But here's what I knew. I knew that Jesus was God in the flesh, and I knew that Jesus died on the cross. Remember, I was a six-year-old, and I knew that heaven was real, and I knew that hell was real, and whatever movie we watched, it was a depiction of hell, and I was scared to death as a six-year-old, and I didn't want to die and go to hell, and so I sat on my bed that night, and and as best I could, I poured my heart out to God. And I said, I, I'm a sinner, and I know there's a penalty for my sin, and I know Jesus died for my sin, and I want him to be my Savior. And I have no doubts in my mind that as a six-year-old child, I got saved. Now, I didn't always live that way, um, um, and I learned some things as I went along. But, man, I got, I got saved as a six-year-old, and I was eminently thankful for that, eminently thankful that God would look upon me, a, a, a young child, um, and save me. But I didn't understand adoption. And this, this literally changed my life. It changed my walk. It changed my perception and, and those things of God. I understood that justification, and, and Pastor John has preached on this, I understood that justification um, meant that I was declared righteous. So that when God looked at me, he saw Jesus. I was declared righteous. My sin had been forgiven, and I was good with that. But he, he really wasn't a personal God. And I was the age of 33, and I'm not a numbers guy, and I'm, I'm not thinking about Jesus dying at the age of 33, probably, or any of those things. It just happened to be in my life when I was 33. It occurred to me that I could literally have a relationship 
with God. Now, I was already saved. My sins were forgiven. But I got saved so that I wouldn't go to hell. I got saved because I was scared to death of hell. And that's, that's okay because it's a real place. And I don't want anybody to die and to go there. But the fact of the matter is, I, I, wasn't, I didn't realize that I could have a relationship with God. I didn't realize that, man, uh, he would communicate me through his word by his spirit. And I could talk to him in prayer, or just walking or just doing my job. And it blew my mind when, when I felt, felt and, and, and it was realizing I'm beginning to relate to God. God. God is influencing my life. I'm beginning to do things differently because of the influence of God. That's who God is. God didn't send Jesus to die on the cross just so that we wouldn't go to hell, but he did it so that that broken relationship that was, that was broken in the Garden of Eden could be restored between you and between him. That's how wonderful God is. And so I said all that to say uh, this. He's a loving, heavenly father. Something I learned recently is Jesus did not refer, let me rephrase that, the, the only time that Jesus referred to God as he was personally speaking was when he was on the cross, he was being crucified, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All the other interactions personally speaking about relationship between Jesus and the Heavenly Father, he always called him Father. And so I was reading a book and I was reminded, hey, Wally, he's your heavenly father. Yes, he's God, but think of him as your heavenly father. Think of him as your heavenly father. Remember, he's your father. And this is something that you have in Christ. And th this was a big thing to me, and it might be nothing to you this morning. But man, it changed how I walked with him. It doesn't mean my walk with him is perfect, but it changed how I related to him. It changed how I saw him because he is my loving heavenly father. And that's all been proven in Jesus. Verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the person or in the one Jesus he loves. I was sitting in the back there before service started and Josh and I um, were talking and he was talking about the amazing grace of God. Grace just reaches down, but it's so amazing it just reaches down deeper to where we're all at. The amazing grace of God. Let me ask you, are you blown away this morning by the grace of God? We might not be. I, I, I didn't come to church contemplating the grace of God. I just knew I wanted to come to church and I wanted to worship God and I wanted to be with fellow brothers and sisters who wanted to worship God as well. But the grace of God is amazing that he would reach down in Jesus to save us. There's much more um, that could be said here that I could read. Matter of fact, I, I have to read one more. It's verse 7. Through Jesus, the Bible says, we have the forgiveness of of sins. So I'm going to impart the gospel here. Here's what the gospel says. The gospel says that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. The gospel says that Jesus was and is the son of God, that he lived a perfect life and he could be the sacrifice for our sins. And the Bible says when he was on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him in Jesus. And so Jesus isn't just a historical figure. He, he is the literal son of God that walked on earth, that was crucified on a cross. And the Bible says that something spiritually was taking place. All of our sin was being thrust on him. And if you by faith through the grace of God will believe, I think it's Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And when it says that you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, here's what the Bible's saying. You need to line up and believe that Jesus is who the Bible says he is. Now, that's some deep stuff. Would you agree with me? I mean, the Bible says that Jesus was virgin born. That is supernatural. That doesn't just happen, but he is God in the flesh. So man, I'm down with that. I'm good with that. And it occurs to me sometimes when I'm in the jail and I'm sitting there with a group of adult men and some of these guys have not heard these things and I'm sharing with them, here's what the Bible says. And some of them look at me like, you really believe that? Yes. Why? Because I think the Bible is the word of God. I believe with my heart that the Bible is the word of God. And I think it's 100% accurate. And God would not lie. And God says that Jesus was born of a virgin. But then it says he died for us. We don't have to work for it. We don't even have to attend church for it. Although I'll say if you're a believer, you're, you're going to join yourself up with, with a church. It's going to love on you and edify you. But you don't go to church to be saved. You go to church because you are saved. So we have all of this in Christ, including the forgiveness of sins. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you've never experienced the forgiveness of sins. You ever done somebody wrong ever and then you went to them and you made it right? Remember how good that made you feel? Like, oh, I don't have this hanging over my head anymore. Oh, I'm, I don't have to worry about this anymore. I've taken care of this. Putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, for a relationship with God the Father is a thousand times better feeling than that. But it's more than just a feeling. Okay, the goodness, the greatness of God, scene one. Um, scene two is our response. How, how should we how should we respond? The closing scene, chapters 4, 5, and 6, describe our response to what God has done for us in Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think that our lives should be a little bit different than someone's life who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Yeah, I, I think so. As a matter of fact, the Word of God covers that. The Word of God talks about this, and Paul's writing about it here in chapter 5. Here's the big idea. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. The big idea is this. Follow God's example. That's the big idea. He has given us an example. The older versions that, that I grew up with say, be imitators of God. And so, um, following God's example. I remember when I was a young man, when I was a child really, my dad trying to teach me some things. I remember him. We were in our garage and we were cleaning the garage out. And uh, for whatever reason, some guy came and, and uh, I think he was trying to sell my dad something or they had a meeting. I just didn't know about it because I was a kid. And they were talking and I was really shy and my dad tried to introduce me to this man. And I kind of hid over by the workbench and didn't really say anything. And when that guy left, um, my dad took me, um, took me aside and he said, son, from now on, when I introduce you to somebody, I want you to look them in the eye and I want you to shake their hand. I want you to put your hand out there and shake them. And so I, I, I developed that habit. I began to look people in the eyeball and I began to shake their hand. And I saw my dad, by way of example, do those things. And here, Paul is writing to the, to the believers at Ephesus. And they were, I, I guarantee you, they were much like Emmanuel. There were people that were saved um, um, for a good little amount of time there, although Christianity was new. And there were baby Christians and people just coming into the fold. And there were probably people there that didn't know Christ yet, but uh, were part of the church or at least meeting um, with the church people and all those things. And Paul says this, follow God's example. Listen, because this is who God is, because this is all that God has done for us, those first three chapters, remember, I want you to live your lives like this. Follow God's example. So he gives us a few things. I want to quickly share those with us um, this morning, and uh, uh, then we'll pray and we'll be on our way. Number one is this. He says, follow God's example Verse 2, he says, and this is number one, and walk in the way of love. You follow God's example. And then he says, and walk in the way of love. The verse goes on to say, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant um, offering and sacrifice to God, you walk in love. Let me ask you this. How different do you think the places we go could be? How much impact could we have on people if you and I, those who name the name of Jesus Christ, walked in love. Seriously. So I'm, I'm getting up there in age. I'm not old yet, but I'm getting up there in age. And here's what I recognize. Um, I have gotten to the point in life just about where I think it's really important for people to know what I think. Thank you. Thank you. It's not good, but thank you. Um, it's not a great place to be, but I find the older I get, I have more opinions inclined to share those opinions uh, than I should be. And sometimes they're not always loving opinions. Sometimes, man, I just think you need to know uh, what I'm thinking, and so here you go. Well, fortunately, the Holy Spirit communicated with Paul to write down, walk in love. As a result of who God is and what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, you, the children of God, the followers of Jesus, you're supposed to walk in love. You ever had somebody drive in the passing lane on the expressway in front of you when you were in a hurry? Am I the only one in this room? I, I learn a lot about my wife, and I learn a lot about myself driving a car. I'm not going to share a wife story. I'm just not going to do that. Um, but I, I do learn a lot. And, and here's what I'm learning or have learned. In most cases... 100% probably, she is more gracious than I am. 
she will share with me. And I appreciate this because this is not how I'm wired. I, I'm a jerk by nature and I recognize that. But, but my wife will be like, hey, you don't know what's going on in their life. I hate that one. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know where they're going. Um, um, sometimes I get in the mindset or I get in the mode where they're doing this on purpose just to spite me. They don't know me. They've never seen my car before, but yet I, I have the idea that, hey, they're just doing this. They're trying to get me. And my wife has to say, seriously, I hate to admit this to you, but my wife has to say, honey, they don't even know you. And if they did, they wouldn't be impressed anyway. She didn't say that, but she thought it. And um, honey, it, it just, it, stop. Just, it's okay. Just slow down. Just calm down. Just get in the left-hand lane. I have another one. drive throughs I mean, for goodness sake, it's called fast food. Am I wrong? <laughs> and so fast food should be fast. But here's, here's what I know. I have no idea what's going on in the life of that person who has that headset on. I have no idea whether their manager trained them or not. I have no idea whether they know how to do their job or not. I have no idea what's going on in their lives. And sometimes, I know mean, this is so super simple and, and maybe oversimplified, we do not know what's going on in the lives of people that we come in contact with. And here's what the Bible tells us. Hey, you who name the name of Jesus, walk in love. Live in love. I suspect that God put that in the word of God because it would be really important. It would make a difference in those that we come in contact with. How about just in our, how about just in our homes? Just walking in love just being preferential, and you guys know this, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. The New Testament was predominantly written in the Greek language, and the Greek language is a lot more descriptive than our modern English, and so we have the word love, and for us, that means feelings, and that means friends, and that means spouses, and, and it covers all these things, but in, in, in the original language, there's many words uh, for the word love, and I won't break those down, but I will tell you this, that this is that Bible word, agape, and I know you've heard it from this pulpit, I'll repeat it, agape love is this. It's the willing. And so it starts off with, we need to be willing to do this. Hey, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today, but for the sake of Jesus and because of all the promises I have in Christ by God, I'm willing to do this. It's the willing, sacrificial giving of oneself for the benefit of another without thought of return. Now, can I ask you, did Jesus exemplify that for us? The willing, sacrificial giving of oneself for the benefit of another without thought of return. That's the Greek word that Paul chose. That's the Greek word that was used. And he says this, we're to walk or to live our lives in that love. Folks, the world through us needs to see and experience the love of God. You know what I've learned about myself? I can't produce that. I can't just say, Wally, love like Jesus today. I can't do it. I'm not wired that way. I'm going to hurt somebody. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get frustrated. My schedule is going to get messed up, and it's going to make me haywire. That's just who I am and, and what I'm learning by process of elimination. That's how many of us are. And the fact of the matter is, it's this. I am crucified with Christ except I'm still living. It's not me, but it's Christ who lives in me. So the children of God need to yield themselves moment by moment to Christ or the Spirit of Christ living in us, and God will produce that in us. What will he produce? Walking in love. You know what that means? That means that there could be a Republican and a Democrat in this room. And the one thing that bonds us together is who? Christ. We might not agree politically. And if you talk to me long enough, I'll try to change it to my side. But we can love each other, right? Pastor John said it two weeks ago, probably, in one of his messages, and it resonated with me. We can disagree with somebody and still love them. And we've lost that. We can't blame the world. That's on us. We have lost the ability to disagree and to still love. I think one of the greatest gifts of the church is this, that God puts all of us in this building and we are messed up and we are broken and we need Jesus and we came in with our own foibles and our own goofiness and our own problems and the fact of the matter is our own ideas and he puts us in this room together and he tells us to love one another. 
Get along. You're part of the church. You're the body of Christ. Um, let me, through you, make, make me look good. Let me glorify myself. This is the greatest training ground from what the Word of God teaches us because somebody in this room is going to bug you. They are. Let the Lord use that in our lives to walk in love. The second thing I see here, and I'll quickly move along, is this. He says um, in verse 3 and verse 5, let me read it to you. Oh, man. I've got to put my reading glasses on. Not happy about that. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. He's writing to believers. Or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Uh, look down at verse 5. He says, For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such uh, a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Much could be said there. But I'm going to boil it down to these three words. Forsake selfish pursuits. Man, it's not about me. It's about God. It's about his glory. It's about Jesus Christ and magnifying him. It's not about me. It's not about the color of the carpet or the color uh, of a platform. It's not about any of these things. The Bible is teaching us as God is great and as he changes us that we are to forsake selfish pursuits. Do we have to train little children to do right or to do wrong? You ever try to take a toy from a, from a child? Especially when other children are around? You ever done that? Holy cow. But here's the deal. We have that in us. And Paul reminds them, hey, you know what? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, because of what God in Christ has done for you, I want you to set aside these selfish pursuits. Live your lives for others. Number three is this. It's wordy. I'm going to warn you right now. Replacing filthy talk and flippant speech with communication rooted in thanksgiving to God and affirmation to others. Replacing wrong speech. I was, um, I was driving home one day. I officiate high school football, and I was riding with one of the guys on my crew, um, my crew is made up of some believers and some non-believers. There's seven of us. And I have, I have uh, grown to become good friends with this fella. He's one of the non-believers. And as a matter of fact, I would say he loves me and I love, I love him. Um, we've been through a lot together, him and his family. And he looked at me one night. He was driving and he just leaned over and he says, why don't you swear? I thought that was an odd question. Um, you know, adult man to adult man. And he said, why don't you swear? And I really was taken back by it. And I realized that that night uh, we had had a coach just blow up on us and, and, and spit and sputter every word in the book that you can think of. And he was really angry. And one of my wing guys went back at the coach with the same kind of language. And, and uh, you know, officials, we're not professional, but we're supposed to calm the situation and all those things. And I came over and got the other official out of there and talked to this coach, not to his liking, if I remember correctly. But I just didn't swear. And that had a, an impact on this grown man, and he says, well, why don't you swear? And that opened the opportunity. He didn't get saved that night, but it opened the opportunity for me to talk to him about Christ. Hey, you know what? I used to swear. I used to swear quite badly as a young man. And I got saved, and God began to work in my life, and I realized that that wasn't going to point anybody to Jesus or bring glory to God. And I asked him to help me to stop doing that. And he did. But here Paul teaches um, these people that, hey, you know what? When you decide to put something off, like verse 4, he says this, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. When you put those things aside, you need to replace them with something. And here's what I want you to do. Be thankful. Be thankful. Wouldn't it be great if people could hear how thankful we are? Man, I'm thankful we sang about it for breath in our lungs. I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful that God has adopted me. I'm thankful that God has elected. I'm thankful that God has sealed us by his Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful for my spouse. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful that I can even get out of bed this morning. I'm thankful that my car had heat and that I had a scraper um, because I got here so early. I'm thankful for all these different things. Man, I, I am thankful That's not my normal course in day by day. So you know what the Lord did? He married me to somebody who's thankful. You know what I found out? 
A thankful person can still frustrate me. <laughs> you guys pray for me if you would, please. Uh, more importantly, pray for my wife. Uh, no, it is, it's good to be thankful. And here's why. When we are thankful, sincerely, God gets the glory. God is glorified when his people are thankful to him for what he has done. And that influences and impacts people to just take a real life stare at Jesus. Hey, he's done something in my life. He's at least made me thankful. He can save you. Number four is this, and I'm going quickly. Exercising discernment about what we are told so as not to be susceptible to trickery from others. I'm just going to read verses six and seven. They say this, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Listen, everything that names itself Christian is not. Just know that. Don't be deceived by everything that comes down the pipe. Here's what we do. We take this book and we filter what we're hearing. That's why when a guy in jail can say, oh, I don't think Jesus is that man. That is who Jesus is. This is what the word of God says about Christ. We, we ha you have to believe that. If you can't believe that, you are not a child of God. And that's not me being narrow-minded or, or mean. That's just telling the truth out of love. And, and so we need to exercise discernment about what we are told and not be susceptible to trickery from others. Listen, um, this is not just for young people. This is for all of us older people and middle people as well. We need to root our thinking and our belief in Scripture. It has to come from the Bible. I suppose that you are here in part because John preaches from the Bible. He doesn't get up. He doesn't open the USA Today and say, turn to page three. He doesn't grab People magazine and say, hey, we're going to look at this article today. He stands in the pulpit and he says, hey, take your Bibles. This is where we're going to be today. Why? Because the Bible is the word of God. John 17, 17 says, set them apart or sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. We just need to line up. Number five is this. As a result of who God is and what he has done for us in Christ, um, we should respond accordingly. Paul says this to these young believers at Ephesus. Hey, leave situations where evil is the agenda. Verse 11 and verse 12 says this. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. I'll, I'll give a quick example and we'll move to the last point and we'll be done. It's, it's this. I was in jail and uh, I, was, I was chaplain in jail. And um, a guy came up to me and he said, Wally, I want to tell you a joke. And I looked right at him and I said, can I tell my wife this joke? I don't know why that's what popped in my head, but that's what popped in my head. And I said, can I tell my wife that joke? And he paused. He hesitated. And I said, I tell you what, don't tell me the joke. And he really wanted to tell me this joke. And I, I, don't, I don't know what the joke is because he didn't tell me the joke. But um, he wanted to tell me this joke. And then a couple other guys who are his friends, who are mutual friends of mine, um, came and said, hey, man, don't, don't try to tell Chaplin that joke. He doesn't need to hear that joke. I don't know what that joke was. But immediately I recognized this probably is not going to edify. This probably is not going to glorify God. This probably isn't going to be something that, that I should hear. And it is a good litmus test. Hey, can I tell this to this important person in my life that you know is a believer? And if not, let's just leave it off. There are some times that we need to remove ourselves from a situation or from people and trust and believe that God is big enough to take care of them. It's just what the word says. And then the last one is this, managing our time well. Verse 16 in our old uh, version says redeeming uh, the time. But here it says making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Let me just end with this thought. Our lives matter. How we live our lives matter. We were designed to bring glory to God. As a matter of fact, in closing, turn to chapter 3. 
um, verses 20 and 21. Uh, this, is, this really could be the anthem, but this is what Paul says. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory in the way that my life is lived. To God be the glory and in and, and how we um, present him. To God be the glory is what I'm doing. Making God look or bringing, making God look good or bringing the right opinion of him. That is what glorify means. And part of that is managing our time well. Just recognizing I might have one opportunity to talk to this person about Christ. I might have one opportunity to show this person what living in love is. I might have one opportunity to set aside my selfishness and bring God glory. God wants to use us to make him look good. God wants to use us to bring people uh, to him. God wants to intersect uh, with us, and he wants to be glorified in our lives. Now, primarily how that happens is we preach to ourselves often, chapters 1, 2, and 3, the goodness of God the promises of God, what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ, where we are seated um, now. That is how that, that takes place. I'll end with this thought. It's not about being busy. It's about being effective. Paul wasn't telling these Ephesians, hey, just fill your, fill your time slots with all these things to do and you'll be busy and you'll be okay. No, no, no. We're not trying to imitate God or to follow his example in order to fill our time or to be busy, but to be effective. Listen to this but to be effective in edifying or building each other up and reaching a lost world with the gospel of Christ. Building each other up. We have been given that task. Man, I am supposed to speak to you to build you up, and you're supposed to speak to me to build me up to edify, but we're to be concerned about a lost and dying world that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul writes this and says, listen, as a result of what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ for you, this is how that should show itself, and when that does, God will receive glory in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Father, thank you for a place that we can come and meet. We can sing praises to your great name, and thank you that that was done today, as it is every week here in this place. Lord, I, I just want to pause for a moment. And I want to pray for that person that might be in this audience and this group of people today that might not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, I pray that you would work in their heart, that you would um, let them know your great goodness to them, your love for them in Jesus Christ. Father, may they know today that Jesus Christ died for their sins, specifically as he has died for mine and the sins of the rest of those who have trusted in him today. Father, may today they talk to somebody in this building and may they put their faith in Jesus, know that their sins are forgiven and be adopted into your family. Father, for those of us who claim the name of Jesus Christ and who have been saved, I pray that you would use this, this simple reminder. Father, because of what you have done for us in Christ, you have called us to be a different people. You even say a peculiar people in one place. Father, we don't have to try to act weird. But Father, by, not, um, by loving, by not being selfish, by redeeming the time, by being thankful instead of some of the other conversations, Father, people will consider us different. They will consider us uh, weird in some cases. So be it. Father, I pray that you would put within us a desire to bring you glory. And as we yield ourselves to you, may you work that out and be glorified in each one of our lives. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, the word of God. And we thank you for this church. Father, thank you for what you're doing here and for broadening uh, the sphere of influence that we have into another community. And Lord, may you bless those endeavors as we seek to follow you with our whole hearts. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. A couple of things just by way of announcement. The first, follow along with the sermon series on the devotionals. Um, this week we're talking about multi-site. We've got a, a testimonies in there from our staff. Just encourage you to read those. They're on the uh, app. You can also get a hard copy at the Welcome Center. Uh, the Kersley Trunk Retreat is this Thursday. 
uh, the 28th. Uh, if you signed up for a trunk or one of those things, or you maybe even still want to sign up, you can at the back. Remember to bring candy. Uh, we still need some more. We're dropping ours off at Kersley tomorrow. Um, if you're not signed up, you're not helping anywhere, that's great. I want you to pray. Pray for this event that God would be glorified and that the gospel would go out. People would see that we are a church that loves them and an opportunity for us to connect with people in the future. Uh, remember to buy tickets for Sanctus Real, the concert that's coming up November 5th. You can go to our website, eflint.org forward slash concert, and sign up for that. We do have Sanctus Real coming. You won't want to miss it November 5th. Um, you can buy tickets there. I have two other things for you. Upward Basketball signups are now available. You can go to eflint.org forward slash upward. K4 through 5th uh, grade, make sure you sign up your children there. Pay the fee. This week is the last week to get the discount. So make sure to check that out. Otherwise, the prices go up after this week. So make sure you get the discount by signing up this week. The final thing is there are no midweek activities this week, so Wednesday and Thursday. The only thing going on, Celebrate Recovery, is still Thursday at 7. Otherwise, Magnify, Amplify, Men's, Women's, Awana are all canceled. It's intercession. Enjoy your family. We will see you back next Sunday. All right, let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer. Father God, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship and celebrate who you are. We're grateful that the risen Christ is no longer dead, but he's alive, and we can live fully and freely in him uh, for you. God, dismiss us with your blessing now, we ask in, in, in your name. Amen.